we are here with Ryan Simonetti, who's the, um, aside from being fun to chat with about uh, football teams, is the CEO of Convene. And Ryan, it's been a, a wild ride since uh, your inception in 2009. Um, and you just made a big acquisition. So thank you for taking the time to do this. We super appreciate it. I'm sure you're uh, on the road all the time and have lots on your uh, plate more, right now. More, more than my wife would like, that is for darn sure. Yeah. Yes. What, what percentage of time do you spend on the road? You know, it's, it's interesting. And, and, you know, I think COVID um, for all of us was an opportunity, I think, to reflect. And, you know, one of the things I reflected on was just how um, as much as I thought I was present, how not present I really was, especially for my kids and, and my family. I mean, I was traveling pre-COVID 130 to 140 days a year, right? So, you know, pretty much every week I was gone. Um, and so I've made a conscious effort, uh, you know, coming out of COVID to be much more, I'd say, thoughtful and disciplined about how I travel. So now I'd say I'm traveling at least once a month, but nowhere near uh, what I was doing. So then where do you, where do you work when you're not on the road? Well, so we have a lot of locations. Uh, and so I tend to float a lot. Um, we've got a corporate headquarters uh, in New York city, downtown, um, you know, which, you know, we're, we've kind of shifted to, I would say truly remote first. Um, but there is a hybrid component to that. So I'll spend time there. And then, you know, wherever the meetings are, uh, you know, I end up, so I'll spend time working, you know, in Midtown from different locations. Uh, and then obviously when I'm on the road, uh, you know, we've got lots of nice, beautiful spaces like Geo's in right now in Chicago to, to hunker down in. Um, but yeah, I would say I'm living the hybrid life fully right now. Yeah. And so it's, it's so interesting how, this changed the dynamics for all of us, right? I mean, no longer is it, we have to be stagnant from any one given place. It's funny, uh, one of your counterparts, when we when we did ours with Jamie, he texted us and he's like, is it okay if I do this from home? We're like, bro, you do it from whatever <laughs> you want, right? I mean, exactly. But it's given us permission to really uh, allow a work-life balance. Like I tell people we've never had in the U.S. before, right? I mean, I think you go to other parts of the world and there is a, a work-life balance, but we haven't had it here in the U.S. to the level we have it today. Yeah, no, and and look, I you know I think that's one of hopefully the healthy things that um, you know comes out of this, and you know I think pendulums can always swing too far, and I think you're starting to see right now, depending on industry, a lot of pushback, and you're kind of forcing people back and. <laughs> You know, maybe in certain businesses and industries you can do that, but I think more broadly speaking, um, you know, hopefully this is actually a healthy shift where, you know, to your point, you know, people can find balance, especially, you know, as working parents, it's hard. Um, and, you know, uh, I see it with my wife being a working mom. Uh, your you know, wife's the working mom and puts up with your schedule. Yeah. And yeah. she's, you know, she was a man, she was a managing director at Deutsche <laughs> Bank in their real estate finance group. And she's now building uh, a real estate investment platform for a big hedge fund in New York. And, you know, so she has a very, you know, she's a very aspirational, she works really hard and cares deeply about her career, but at the same time, she wants to be a great mom. And there's only so many hours in the day and you can only be in one place at one time. And, you know, I think that type of flexibility in particular for her as a working mom is like, it's critical. Ryan, do you think that's influenced your approach to how you, the expectations that you have of your own team? Um, you know, we've always been a return on work environment. You know, even since Chris and I, you know, we first co-founded the business back in 2009, uh, you know, we wanted to do things a little bit differently. And you know, even then we were, we were calling it like return on work, which was, you know, we know if you're performing or not. Uh, but, you know, if you want to take a long vacation or travel or work remotely, um, you know, now obviously for our on-site teams, you know, just given the nature of the service delivery model, you know, they don't have as much of that flexibility, which we're trying to create ways for them to get it as well. But we've always, I think we've always been pretty progressive, um, uh, and ahead of the curve, at least on, on that stuff. Well, not just that stuff. I think all of it, I still remember the first time I walked into your space for, for an event. I forgot what event it was, but I was just like, Oh my gosh, this is absolutely gorgeous. I mean, the, the attention to detail that you have in your spaces, everything from the woodwork, uh, I'm looking at the, 
at the conference room wall right now if anyone's watching i mean it's yeah. i mean it's just crazy the curtains the wallpaper i mean it's just all so well thought out um that you know it's it's first of all the space but then the hospitality is the other part right is and so i think it's it's really interesting to talk about your background because you don't come from the hospitality industry, right? But yet hospitality is such a major part of your overall drive for the company. So Yeah, and, and, and so one thing I want to shout out is we've got an incredibly talented uh, design team and product team uh, internally. And you know, we're very fortunate to work with world-class partners. I think they constantly push us. Um, and, you know, one of the things we talk about, and, you know, I think it, it's a little bit about, especially being successful in the hospitality, but like God is in the details. And, you know, whether that's in the details of service delivery or the details of menu design or the details of producing the technology for uh, a high profile event, which we do a lot of, or the details of a space, um, you know, it is something that, you know, I think we obsess over uh, probably to a fault, um, but it is one of the things that, we, you know, we feel does you know, ultimately differentiate us uh, amongst amongst other things. And, you know, but I do want to say I, you know, my career was in real estate finance and investing, but I grew up in the food business. Okay. So, so my dad, um, who's had obviously a major influence in my life, was actually an entrepreneur. Uh, okay. And he owns, I don't know, has anyone ever had it? You ever Shake Shack Burger? Oh, Yeah. Well, the bun that is on that Shake Shack burger, my dad bought one of the first delivery routes in New Jersey for that company. And so when I was a young kid, I'm talking like 9, 10, 11 in the summers, I'd get on the back of a bread truck with him at three o'clock in the morning, and we would go deliver to supermarkets, restaurants, and Shake Shack's now customers, they weren't around back then. So I've actually been in and around the food business and the hospitality my whole life. My, all my jobs in high school. My first job was doing dish at a restaurant in town. I, I worked at Friendly's. Like, I delivered pizzas. So I would say as much as my professional post-college career wasn't yeah. in hospitality, uh, most of my best early professional experiences were actually working uh, in the industry. Wow, that's that's amazing. I did. That's what I get for jumping to conclusions, right? <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. That being said, you know it. It's not most people who would kind of take the leap and um, you know leave a high profile, well paying, uh, you know, uh, real estate investment job and take the risk to be an entrepreneur. Can you just talk about that a little bit and sort of what the vision was and and then we'll, we'll, we'll get to today. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I spent the early part of my career in, in real estate finance. Um, I started at Lehman brothers and then I went to a, a company called Gramercy capital, which, uh, you know, when I joined, I think I, maybe I was the seventh or, or eight higher and it was a very small business, but talk about growth. I mean, we went from a couple hundred million in assets under management to multiple billions in like the blink of an eye and in, in literally like two and a half or uh, or three years. And, you know, I think one of the benefits of working in a high growth environment, especially as a young person that is ambitious, if you put your hand up, a lot of times you just get chosen. And so at a really young age, um, you know, I was taking on a tremendous amount of responsibility. I mean, I was up for an MD promotion when I was what, 26, wow. um, and was running, um, you know, uh, a part of the investment side of that business. And then when the world started uh, to fall apart, um, you know, in kind of late 07 into 08, uh, you know, I spent a lot of time doing workouts and restructurings and, and kind of trying to work with, you know, our different uh, operating partners um, and, you know, developers that we had lent money to uh, on kind of how to navigate out of those situations. And it just so happened uh, I spent a lot of time doing office and a lot of time doing hospitality. And I think if if folks remember back in like 2005, 2006, 2007, that was really the birth of lifestyle as a movement. Um, it's a lifestyle in food, right? It's Whole Foods, it's Wegmans, it's the birth of Soul Cycle, it's Equinox, it's W Hotel, it's Ian Schrager. And so I was kind of seeing 
what was happening within hospitality, both macro, but then within some of the, the investments that we were in. And nobody had thought about bringing that to office yet. And so the thesis was, well, what if you kind of ran an office building like a boutique fully serviced hotel, you know, could you change the value proposition and experience for the tenants? Could you use that space to bring the community in and kind of monetize it in a different way? Uh, and then ultimately the landlord would make more money. Uh, and so that was really the thesis back in 2008 when we came up with the idea and 2009 when we launched, uh, you know, kind of mid crisis. And yeah, I think unfortunately we were just like 10 years ahead of the industry's thinking. I was yeah. going to say that was a really early thesis, especially with that timing. Yeah. And then you yeah. had, I mean, that's tough timing. And then living through COVID, of course. Yeah, I mean, yeah. what do they say? Iron sharpens iron. Uh, and so <laughs> born, born in a crisis, uh, you know, I'd say push deeply in the last one. And then, you know, I think uh, you know, we learned a lot through, I think, each of those experiences. And, you know, I think the fact that we we're able to survive, which obviously was not easy, um, but kind of navigate our way to where we are today. And, you know, I think, as we all know, you know, there's not a landlord on earth not talking about amenitizing their building. Uh, there's not a company on earth not talking about outsourcing more of their real estate experience. Uh, you know, and I think we find ourselves today in a really uh, interesting, interesting spot. And, you know, hopefully all all that we've learned, uh, you know, over the last 13 plus years, um, you know, hopefully puts us in a really good position to take advantage of, uh, you know, I think uh, I've been I've been waiting for this moment uh, and preaching <laughs> from the hilltops for a long time. And, you know, I think we finally are at this really exciting inflection point for for not just us, but uh, I think the industry, you know, more broadly speaking. Are, are you about to be an overnight success uh, <laughs> after 13? <laughs> uh, 13 uh, painful years? Uh, sure, I'll take it. I am, I'm curious, and then I'll let Gio jump in. I mean, you had a really early vision that was probably pr pretty resisted by your potential clients. Uh, every like, one of them. Compare and contrast the conversations you were trying to have with landlords in 09, 10, 11 to today. What are you talking about? <laughs> right. Um, and, you know, I think for a long time, honestly, I'd say really until 2021. <laughs> uh, I'd say not quite <laughs> 2018, 2019. So you're talking nine to 10 years of, you know, spending a lot of our own money proving that we were right. And then, you know, I'd say finally in late 2018, 2019, we started to see a shift. Um, you know, we, you know, we don't, you know, if you look at the buildings we go into, we're tending to work with very institutional owners and operators, very institutional providers of capital. And so to some extent, by default, we were never really going to work with an early adopter. Yep. And, you know, I think unfortunately, hindsight 2020, what I probably would have done differently is actually had probably focused more of our time and energy on a different type of owner early on that was more entrepreneurial and probably would have better positioned themselves for a first mover. But the type of brand that we were building, the locations we need to be in, the assets we need to be in, um, you know, I think that kind of always forced us to work with, you know, I'd say, which just tend to be later adopters and, and it's okay. I mean, we, uh, uh, you know, we're, we made it here, um, uh, but uh, yeah, I'd say a huge shift in the conversation today versus even, you know, 36 months ago. Yeah, and I think, you know, so part of where Jamie and I are different, it's always fun. Jamie's all about business and sometimes I just love the personal <laughs> side of people. So uh, I saw your post in which you talked about going to antique shops with your mom and you hated it. But yet, she tortured me. She tortured me. What do you mean? <laughs> I've been in therapy for 20 years because of that. <laughs> About all your Saturdays. That... <laughs> and now you have these beautiful spaces that are full of incredible furniture, right? So it was it was for something. Oh, no. Look, you know, it's amazing. You know, our 
especially as I'm getting older and now that I'm a parent, I'm appreciating this more. Um, but, you know, our experiences is what shapes us. And, you know, I think especially in our formidable younger years, um, both the good things we go through and the traumatic things that we go through shape ultimately who we are. Uh, and, uh, you, know, uh, you know, thankfully I had a great influence in my dad that always pushed me to, you know, dream big and be your own boss and you can be an entrepreneur. And, you know, his big thing was just don't ever let anyone outwork you. That's the only thing that you control. And then I had a mom uh, who, you know, was pushing me at a young age, even though hindsight 2020, I had no idea was to start to appreciate some of these other things in life like design. Um, and so, uh, you know, thankfully I had both of those influences. <laughs> So what, what, what would you say your mom's favorite characteristic about you is? Um, you know, my mom's always had an adventurous spirit. Uh, you know, she grew up very, very poor. Uh, and so I think by that experience, her world by design was so small, right? Like her life and was never bigger than like probably the, the town that she had grown up in, but she always aspired and dreamt to, to travel and do other things. And um, and I'd say I got a lot of that from her and, you know, I'd say she's probably most proud that, uh, you know, I've, I've had an opportunity to see and do, um, and to travel as, as much as I, as I have. And so much of that was due to their hard work and the opportunities they gave. Oh, of, of I mean, course. It, it, it takes a village. Yeah, for sure. And you brought up traumatic experiences, and this is going to take you back. So I was in the in our AY office in DC talking to Josh Payton. And so uh, my boy Josh, I love that guy. Yeah, we we started talking about you and this pod this uh, podcast that we had scheduled. And he's like, ask him about the Uber driver that kidnapped him. <laughs> So, so I, I kind of forgot about this and I was actually Flash um, blocked it out. <laughs> no, it, it, well, probably okay. a little bit of that, a little bit of that too, but I was, <laughs> we were in, we obviously we announced a huge uh, acquisition, which I know we'll probably talk about something, but I was in yeah. London last week, um, you know, with the teams and we, we went out to dinner, a small group of us, uh, including some of the senior team uh, at uh, et cetera venues. And um I guess what came up was the first day of onboarding for a new hire. And so it just so happened that I wasn't the only person in the car that day. That was our new head of sales first day on the job. And so we were going to tour um, a potential new location with the landlord. We got out and then we had had a lo location in Tyson's corner and, you know, from downtown, uh, you know, out to Tyson, it's probably 25, 30 minutes. So we're going to yeah. take an Uber. So we're walking out of the building, the Uber's there, we're getting into the car. And then there was a police car behind us with lights on, but we were, I wasn't paying attention to, because we're having a conversation. We get in the car, I sit in the front seat, they get in the back seat to the guys that work with me. And the driver gets out of the car and goes to then talk to the officer, comes back in the car. We're still talking. I said, oh, is everything okay? He's like, oh yeah, no, we're fine. It was just a traffic cop. We start taking off. Well, the next block is a traffic light and the light is clearly yellow about to be red. And this guy guns it. And like, I'm like, whoa, that was aggressive. And then I look in the side view mirror, that cop is also gunning it through the red light. Next thing you know, we are in a 20 minute, I'm talking out of cops. Police cars, hell, I mean, the whole thing, <laughs> doing 100 miles an hour, heading on our way out to Tyson's Corner. And then finally, um, after some very aggressive convincing, uh, which included me taking my seatbelt off and wrestling with the guy to try and get control of the car, he finally like took an exit ramp. And we pretty much jumped out of the car while it was still moving. And then he proceeded to go up the wrong way of the highway. So yeah, that happened. That was, that was so that was for those of you that don't know, Ryan, you're what? Six, five and an athlete. Six, six, six four. I'm a little lighter now, two fifteen, Uh, and yeah, I used to be an athlete. 
Well, then and I and I also trained like Muay Thai and boxing. I was about to and say, I've had, you're, you're I've, had, I've, had, I've had a few amateur fights in my day. So yeah, he was telling me that, and I was like, "That is crazy." What did the guy do? So it turned what it turned out was what some of the Uber cars were doing is they don't want the car sitting. So I would have the license under my name, and then what would they would do is have other people drive under that license to keep the car going 24 yeah. hours a day. Okay. Entrepreneurial. Uh, uh, entrepreneurial. Okay, and, far, and, yeah. <laughs> and what it turned out was that the driver was actually illegal in the country and he was so afraid of getting caught mm -hmm. and ultimately getting deported that mm -hmm. he freaked out, literally freaked out. So oh. did, they, did Uber charge you for that, right? Uh, no, I got a full refund. That's and, and and by the way, yes, I saw a question come through. I did take an Uber car from there to <laughs> to Tyson's Corner because the cops wouldn't drop us off. That's awesome. Okay, uh, well, back back on track, Jamie. Let's talk about the uh, acquisition. Okay, let's yes, yeah, so let's talk. But th that was a great story, and I I have lots of. But also, Gio and I are very big on. We just had this the other day. Like, I empathize with that guy. Kind of, or after living through it, maybe not. Imagine being so afraid right. to go back to where you yeah. came from that you would be willing to risk to not, just your, not just your own yeah. life, but the lives of three other people in your car. I mean, yeah. so, I mean, that, that says a lot right there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, no. Anyway. Okay. <laughs> All right. Back to flex. Come on, let's go. Yeah, yeah, back to flex, acquisition. <laughs> let's talk about it. So how'd that acquisition come about? Kind of what's the goal? Eight years it took. What? How about that? So uh, I, met, I love all these confessions. I met, I met the C, I met the CEO um, who became a friend and, and mentor. And, uh, you know, I learned, I've learned a lot from him uh, personally over the last, you know, eight or nine years since we met. But um, yeah, no, uh, they were, this was probably 2000 and maybe 11 or 12 was when we probably first met. So it's, it's almost a decade ago. Uh, and, you know, they were operating, um, you know, meeting and event facilities in London. Uh, and obviously we had just started to expand in New York. And, um, you know, we looked at putting the businesses together. I'd say, what they say? The third time's a charm. Uh, we actually had an offer to acquire the company, signed LOI the day before Brexit happened. Uh, and then Brexit happened, and obviously we couldn't finance the deal. So um, it was uh, it was a long time uh, in the making, and you know an incredible organization, extremely well run, uh, and I think obviously a great complement, um, you know, to to our platform. Uh, you know, it gets us a, a, a tremendous amount more, uh, you know, not just quality locations in the UK and a few in New York, but. Uh, it gives us a real team and an infrastructure that we can build uh, around and grow around. And, um, you know, we'll have that team, not just continuing to focus on, you know, growing in the UK and London, but starting to look into, uh, into Europe, uh, where we think there's some really interesting opportunities um, for us. And, and scale's nice. Um, you know, I had it in 2020 when we were going into COVID and was finally getting the benefit of it. Uh, and, you know, I think to have it now, especially at this moment in time, you know, we think it's a huge competitive advantage, um, you know, combined business has 41 locations, hundreds of millions in revenue, significant profitability, we can self fund our business without being dependent on the capital markets. Um, so I think for a lot of reasons, uh, you know, we definitely feel like this is going to be a, a one plus one equals three for us. That's awesome. So let me ask you a question. As you step back and someone asks you what Convene is today, what is your quick elevator spiel? Because I know it's obviously shifted over the last 13 years. Um, you know, look, I'd say at our core, we're still the same, right? We're a hospitality company um, that, you know, ideally uh, gets to partner with, you know, class A landlords uh, and developers to you know, create a differentiated workday experience. Um, you know, and to us, that workday or that workplace is not just about desks. It's not just about meeting, you know, small meeting spaces. It's also about all that other stuff that happens. Um, and, you know, whether it's large scale meetings and corporate events, um, you know, we see ourselves really as being, you know, probably the only true one-stop solution um, where, 
you know, kind of anything you would need to power a modern experience, um, you know, we can do it. Um, so I'd say that's probably my elevator pitch today. I'm, I'm curious. I think, you know, in running a business, one of the biggest challenges is like lack of clarity and uncertainty, right? You just like not being able to just go, you know, full speed ahead. Do you feel like there's still some uncertainty or do you feel like we got it? This is, we're, um, we're, we're I, you know, running. I would say the world is as dynamic and as uncertain as it's ever been. Um, so you never, no matter how much clarity you have, you never have as much visibility. You never know when there's going to be a Brexit. Well, you, you, as much <laughs> clarity as you or... have, you never have as much visibility you want, yeah. right? And I would say that as a, as a human, as much as I would as a, as a CEO, yeah. I would say for Convene though, as it relates to our business and what we need to do to go be successful and what our strategy is, this is as crystal clear as it's ever been to me personally in 14 years since I've been doing this. Um, uh, and I think part of that is because of what we were talking about a little bit earlier is that finally the market has acknowledged the need. And so I think that has now allowed us to be crystal, crystal clear as it relates to what we need to do and why we need to do it and for who we need to do it for. So I'd say uh, minus the world's uncertainty, I feel pretty confident in you know what we're doing and you know ultimately it's gonna come down to our team. Um, you know, you know, I can, you can only push so much as a CEO, uh, and then it comes down to how bad does your team want it? And, and ultimately they're the ones that have to go out and execute every day, right? They got to deliver an incredible experience, uh, to each one of our clients day in and day out. Um, and then, you know, they're going to have to kind of carry us, uh, and execute on the growth strategy. And so the acquisition, how many locations venues does that bring you up to? Uh, 41. Wow. Uh, and then we've got another probably dozen in some form of development. And then we've got another three to four M&A conversations that we're actively having right now. I, I see Jamie's eyebrows go up. So <laughs> she's, got, she's got more to say about that. No, I was just curious about the ongoing M&A, if there were more opportunities. Well, I mean, so, I mean, I've been saying this forever. The industry needs to consolidate. Um, no, I've seen, I, that was kind of in your 2023 predictions. And I, I've been making the prediction for five straight years. Eventually it comes true, <laughs> right? So, uh, yeah, I, I, I believe for lots of reasons, um, the industry is going to consolidate. Uh, and a lot of it today has to do with the capital markets. Um, you know, if you are a private company today, um, it is incredibly challenging to raise capital. Multiples have or anything to do with office. <laughs> Honestly, anything to do with anything. Um, yeah. You know, uh, I've been a very active early stage investor myself, and it's not just in office. It's really across every asset class and every industry and sector right now. You're seeing massive multiple compression, a holistic repricing of risk and value across everything. Uh, our industry being no different. Uh, and then you've got a lot of businesses, I think, that have not just founders and management teams that are tired, but they have shareholders that are tired. And the only path to liquidity is with scale. With scale, yeah, yeah. It's just no, it's scale. And oh, so scale, think, yeah, scale. And so you know, I think we feel um, that you know, not only do we have a platform with a tremendous amount of infrastructure where we can make these platforms way more efficient, way more profitable, literally the day the deal happens. Um, but we also see an opportunity where we can provide a path to liquidity. Um, and so, yeah, I think M&A for us right now, we've always done it opportunistically. Right now we're doing it strategically and deliberately, which is different. So we've got a we've got a couple of questions. So someone said, "How do you begin the conversation with Class A landlords to take over management aspect of their commercial real estate properties?" Uh, so first and foremost, I think is acknowledge the challenge, which is being an office landlord today is really hard. It's more complicated than it's ever been. It's more capex intensive than it's ever been, and they've got a whole lot of things that they're great at that they need to focus on. 
And I would say amenitizing and monetizing amenities, because to me, whether it's co-working space or meeting an event space or the tenant lounge or the wellness facility, it's not it's all about the amenity, mm -hmm. but it's also how do I make that amenity make money? And I think that's where Convene is really, really good, right? We have a sales and marketing machine. We have a reservation system. We know how to operate. We know how to do it profitably. And I think for landlords, the decision is, do I do it myself or do I partner? That's it. And, you know, I think for the right buildings and the right assets, I mean, in the, in the right geographies that, you know, we're, we're a great partner, as is industrious, as is a number of other really good operators that I think are approaching this in a very, very uh, similar way. So I'd say amenitize and monetize is how I lead that pitch today. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's such an interesting conversation because there's so many people out there having this and landlords that know they need to do this, but there's still a lot of landlords that are hesitating, right? Because of whatever reason. So where, if, if we were to use the, the the baseball innings, right? Where do you feel we are with landlords fully understanding and making the transition to understanding that they need to hand some of these things off to, to an operator like yourself? Uh, you know, I'd say it depends on geography and also what type of landlords we're talking yeah. about. I'd say generally speaking, we're probably in the fourth inning okay. or fifth inning. Um, you know, I, what I'm seeing is that most landlords are acknowledging it's the capital markets that are still struggling, right? So whether it's the asset manager that's put in the LP capital that now has to put up the capital to do this or the lender who needs to finance it, I'm seeing less, I'm seeing more friction there and yeah. less friction as it relates specifically to me as owner, operator, developer of an office building. I, most people we're talking to acknowledge that they have to deliver a different level of hospitality in the building, that they have to integrate flex and amenity strategically in a, in a different way than they have in the past. And I'd say most of the people we're talking to today, including some that vertically integrated to start, are realizing that doing what we do is a different business. It is hard. And yeah. doing it yourself in a capital markets environment, in a macro environment like this, last time I checked, most CEOs I'm talking to today from big and small, uh, focus on your core and outsource your non-core. And to me, you know, landlords doing what we do is non-core. No, I, I agree with that 100%. And we've been meeting with some larger landlords and that's, they're trying to deploy it themselves, right? And it's it's just, it's it's tough, right? If it, it's not what you, your core business is and you know how to deliver that hospitality, it, it gets difficult, um, you know, and we had someone ask basically, how do you build the community aspect of, of that hospitality component? Um hire people that are really passionate about building relationships, doing it systematically and programmatically and have a really deep understanding of what's going to resonate with micro communities from a content and programming standpoint. Um, and I feel like if you can nail that, then a lot of the rest of it happens very organically. And so it's almost like you need to seed it and then the community takes over and almost starts to crowdsource their own content uh, and develops their own relationships. So that's kind of been our, our approach is we want to be a catalyst too, but then ultimately the community drives is, is when it's working really, really well. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that a hundred percent. And, and those are conversations we're driving. There's some people that just aren't ready to, right? I mean, I tour spaces sometimes and I look and the landlord's doing a conference facility on the first floor and on the fifth floor, they got a town hall with the same type of product offering that's on the first floor. And I'm like, who's advising you to do this? <laughs> and their brokers have no idea what's going on, right? I ask them, so what do you think Flex is? It's crazy. So, so the first thing I would say is to all the landlords that might be listening in, Make sure you bring an operator in right away, even if it's just to advise as you're going through your own design process. Because you got to realize most architecture and design firms, they're not operators. 
Right. And so when we design space, we design it as operators first, designers second. And in when you're working with most A&D firms, it's the reverse. And we find ourselves all the time getting brought into situations late. And we're like, um, do you know that based on the way you design this, that you're going to have to staff it with four more FTEs? And that's going to cost you X hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. Do you know that? And there goes the model, right? They don't know. Yeah. And there goes the model. And mm -hmm. so, you know, my recommendation is uh, you know, make sure you're focused early on operationalizing the design first. Gio, there's a question in the Q&A that's addressed to you, but on landlords like Tishman Spire Studio doing in-house versus outsourcing. You know, I'll let you and Ryan mention that, but I was on a call with somebody, we were looking at the Houston market earlier and she's like, oh, there's this, I won't name names. There's a brand that has a lot of locations. And I said, oh, I've not heard of that brand. And I, you know, look it up and their Google listing pops up and it is a flex workspace offered by a landlord. It has two three-star Google reviews, which if you are a an operator, that is death, <laughs> Right. And so that's my example. Not that Tishman is doing that, but I think that's the risk and, and what Ryan is is pointing to, you know, on, on one level. Well, I think such a big part of it is really understanding what the what the offering is, right? We use hotels as a great example is that you got everything from Hotel Six to Ritz Carlton, and I'm not staying in neither one of them, right? But you have everything in between. So I mean, the the landlord you're talking about, and not exactly what you're talking about without you saying it. Um, <laughs> and it might be something about a work style or something like that. But ultimately, they are, a, you know, they're traditionally were a B, B minus buyer. And so they're serving a totally different community than what Ryan is serving, right? And so really understanding who your audience is. And that's, I think, what landlords and operators don't understand is who is our target audience? Yeah, and, and look, that's where, I mean, great consumer-facing brands are ex experts at customer segmentation. Uh, and I think, you know, if you look at the hotel industry as being very mature, you've got many different types of brands with different variations of product offerings that speak to both specific segments, but then even micro-segments within a customer segment. And so I think, now, we'll... we'll our part of the world ever be as diverse as the hospitality industry? Probably not, but there'll be some version of that. And that's why, candidly, you know, we see a huge opportunity to have multiple brands under one global platform with one global loyalty program, right? So I'll use, um, you know, the former CEO of Starwood Hotel Group was our chairman, uh, in incredible human, uh, wonderful mentor. I mean, thank God. Uh, we had him on our team when we were going through COVID. Um, yeah, but when he left, SPG, which was the loyalty program, right, which is think like the app, the rewards, was responsible for almost 60% of the entire chain's revenue from a distribution standpoint. Yeah. And so the question is, if you think in our universe at scale, well, how do we go replicate SPG? at our platform level. And I think to do that though, you have to have scale. And that's the thing that we're very focused on right now. And you gotta have the right scale. Um, but we think that that's a huge opportunity, uh, you know, if you can get scale to start to think more in that direction. And, and I think it's just about knowing, you know, that you have different segmentations, like you said, and, and being very conscious of how you're serving those. Right. And I think that that's a big part that people don't don't know. Right. I can't take how often I walk into spaces. I'm like, so who's your audience? Someone that needs desks. Uh, OK, well, what's your competition? Well, I don't know. I think there's there's a location down the street. Have you ever been in there? Well, no. I'm yeah. like, how do you even know? So it's it's pretty crazy. So here's here's one for you. So obviously there's a lot of workforce strategic shifts right currently with with making changes on on what the strategy of the company is where you're headed i know you, you posted very open about it and you're 
one of the strongest leaders out there of how difficult it is to let people go. I mean, there's people here listening that are either somewhere and know they need to make a transition or have been part of the layoffs at some of these flex operators, some of these op, you know vendors and everything else. And so one of the questions is kind of where do you see opportunity for people within the flex sector to be you know looking for for long-term stability if you will um well look this is a growing sector uh and you know even if maybe you're at a platform that might be struggling i think if you take a step back and just look at the growth even what we're seeing or what's going to be forecast over the next few years there's still a tremendous amount of opportunity within the vertical every uh advisory firm now has dedicated teams of specialists both on the consulting side on the financial modeling side on the uh property management side that all focus on this so i would say generally speaking there's still a tremendous amount of opportunity um you know within the sector the question is are you in the in the right seat at the right place mm -hmm. uh and you know to me that's you know, a part of your journey as a professional uh, is, you know, as you navigate your career is making sure, you know, you're in the right seat at the, at the right place. Um, and I think there's a lot of great places and there's a lot of great seats out there. Speaking of leadership, what, what is your favorite part about being in the role you're in? Uh, you know, look, if, if people always ask, like, you know, if, if you had to define yourself, what would you define yourself as? And I would say, um, your know, number one is a leader period. And then number two is a builder. Uh, I build things, I build companies, I build people, I build teams. So, um, you know, for me, anytime I'm in that seat, mm -hmm. whether I'm coaching my son's basketball team or, running a company or on the board of an organization that's what i enjoy doing that's what gets me up in the morning uh that's what continues to make me put in the work uh you know try and get a little bit better uh each and every day so for me you know I, 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 any seat that puts me there i'm i'm pretty happy geo what's his number oh he's an 8 for sure Oh. Have you ever taken the Enneagram test? No. I'll have to send it. Send it to me. <laughs> he's send a total to challenger, right? And he's a leader and inspire and encourager, all those things. So yeah, I'll be curious to see how that comes back. But all right. Send it over. I'll take it this weekend. <laughs> uh, so here's another one from the standpoint of we talk about how so many people talk about how the UK is or London, Europe in general is further ahead of the U.S. as far as the flex curve goes. Would you agree with that? Well, I just think if you think about maturity, right? So if you look at London and the U.K., there's more serviced office co-working per capita than any other city, if you look at London or country. Um, on the meeting and event and conferencing side, same thing. And so that market for lots of reasons, some of which are structural and how the real estate market works there. And also that you're very height restricted in how big of buildings you can build. Yeah. So a lot of companies there by default had to start to outsource. Um, and clearly, even though our industry has evolved and the product's gotten better and there's all sorts of, uh, you know, new and emerging brands, the industry there is very, very mature. Um, so I would say from a serviced office perspective, very mature market. From a amenitize a building as a class A landlord behind the US mm -hmm. and the most progressive country on earth is Australia. So if I want inspiration, I go to Australia, both from a design standpoint uh, and then from a tenant experience standpoint. Let's see, you're, you're nodding your head, Jamie. I know you- You, you know what? I spoke at a, um, a work tech like in 2013 or, you know, something kind of early on, you know, the, the office evolution path. And there were a, lots of folks from Australia doing case studies. And I was like, why is Australia so like advanced? And very progressive. I, I asked somebody and they said, you know, maybe it's because we're so far away from everything. We always have this fear that we're behind. And so they said they do a lot of like, go out and look and see what the rest of the world is doing and bring it back and do the best thing. And I thought, 
that's pretty interesting and, and maybe that's right but it's a, sort of a unique like cultural dynamic yeah, yeah so i'd say australia to me is always in the lead wow well i guess that just means we need to go to australia jamie oh you've already been there i need to not, by the way not yeah. a bad place to be this time of year i'll tell you that much <laughs> totally especially if, if you're in uh in in chicago so Jamie, it's I love I like putting Jamie on the spot. Come up with a good personal question, Jamie. Get to know. Oh Ryan. well, I have two questions. One is I do want to know how did your dad get to be the bun for the Shake Shack? Oh, uh, so so my dad. And like, is what, how, what what does it look like when Dad comes home and says, <laughs> "Guys, guess what happened at work today?" All right, so so um so this is so my dad is was a complete hustler. So you know both my. Parents had challenging upbringings for different reasons. You know, um, I'm the first person in my family to go to college. Like, you know, we were blue collar family, uh, you know, kind of through and through. So when my dad, when I was young, my dad always had two jobs and a side hustle. Mm. And when I was really young, his side hustle, I don't know if anyone's ever been to Rutgers University in New Brunswick, but there's something really famous called the grease trucks which is everyone pours out of the bars at two o'clock in the morning and there's all sorts of food trucks crafting up the craziest things you could put on a roll. And honestly, my dad, when I was young, like really young, used to have a food truck and would be, after working two jobs, would then go there until 2, 2.30 in the morning. Um, and so he always had like an entrepreneurial hustle in him and we were actually driving home one day. Um, I think we're, I had a baseball practice or whatever. And we're driving home. And outside of this guy's house, there was a box truck and uh, a sign that said business for sale. Hmm. My dad turns right into that driveway, knocks on this dude's house. And literally like a week and a half later, borrowed the money from my uncle or great uncle and ended up buying this business. And that was in, when I was eight years old. Um, and he still runs it to this day. Which, so, but so how do you get in front of Danny Meyer? Well, no, role? Danny Meyer found the role himself. That was always the role that was at the park. And so once Shake Shack opened up in New Jersey, my dad got lucky that he just, that was his role. So he, you know, ended up picking up Shake Shack as a customer. I'm, I happen to be listening. It's a, it's a tiny slow, bit slow, but uh, Danny Meyer's book, Setting the Table. And oh, the best. That was one the... of the first ones we read when we started the business. Yeah. Wait, have you read um, Unreasonable Hospitality? So I somebody just gave it to me. Um, I, I haven't started it yet. Hopefully or listen to it. it. it Christy's on and it stressed her out. You're, you are going to love it. And you might want to listen to it. The yeah. guy's really intense. I think it's a hundred times more interesting than Danny. I mean, he worked for Danny and he did 11 Madison Park and it's so good. Yeah, we, we for a long time, we used to have every one of our leaders read Setting the Table. That was part of their um, onboarding. So we took a lot philosophically out of that book. And then the best advice we ever got. So, you know, Chris and I were, Chris was 26, I was 27. We're starting a hospitality business in the middle of a financial crisis. Um, no business, no experience. I mean, you know, crazy entrepreneurs. Hmm. And um, we had an opportunity. Um, there's uh, a restaurant in New York called Patroon. Um, great restaurant, highly recommend go. Uh, and it's owned, um, his last name is Aretsky. At one time, he was like a really big restaurant for New York, um, like had multiple, multiple units. Uh, and we were, he was kind enough to like take a meeting with us. And we had lunch with him and we said, you know, what advice would you give to two 20 something year old kids that wanted to build a great hospitality company? Mm -hmm. And he said, hello, coffee, goodbye. How do you feel when you show up? What's the last thing you remember before you leave? And how do you feel when you walk out the door? And he said, the most important person that works for me is the doorman because he controls hello and he controls goodbye. And he goes, you better make sure you have fucking good coffee, literally. And so if you think about convene, one of our principles is hello, coffee, goodbye. 
How do you feel when you show up? What's the last thing you remember? Surprise and delight. And then how do you feel when you walk out the door? And candidly, one of the reasons we're always trying to get control of our own entrance or get control of the lobby in the building is so that we can control the welcome experience because it sets the tone. I mean, I don't know how you guys feel, but if I walk into a really nice boutique hotel or a great restaurant and there's a lovely hostess, that feels way different than walking into a class A office building and getting nailed with like, <laughs> um, can you give me your ID, please? Like, I mean, it's just like completely, the whole vibe is just so different. And, um, but that was some of the pearls of wisdom that we were lucky enough to get, uh, to get early on. Well, you, you, your staff here is two out of three so far. Like, I got off the elevator. Like, Dan was standing there waiting for me. He's like, Giovanni? <laughs> the room is back this you. way. He's like, like would you like some coffee? And I don't drink coffee. I'm already hyper enough as it is. But he he, he offered it. Right. So my guess is, he, he asked me, how long is it going to be? I said, it'll be right at an hour. He said, I'll be over there right at four. So we'll see when he well, comes around the corner. Well, like I said, I, you know, um, we're very, I'm very blessed. And we're, I'm very grateful just to have the caliber of humans that we have at this company. I mean, um, you can't make people care. Uh, and, you know, we've got a ton of people that just innately. Right on deeply, cue. Deeply care about delivering a great experience to our customers. Wait, is he waving? Yeah, he's waving. <laughs> he literally just came around the corner, right? I think he heard me. <laughs> They're listening in the walls just to anticipate your next need, Gio. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Gio. is there anything, we've got a couple minutes left, so I want to be really conscious of your time. So is there anything that you want to discuss or share with the last few minutes we have? I mean, y'all are doing a lot of cool stuff over there. Uh, You know, I would just say it's a really as challenging, I think, as the last three years has been for all of us, any of us in and around the industry, and as dynamic and as uncertain the environment is around us, I think for our collective part of the sector and industry, um, there's never been a better moment in time. Uh, you know, I think our, I always tell our team, our customers need us now more than ever. Our landlord partners need us now more than ever. Uh, and I really feel that is, is how it is across uh, the industry. And so, you know, I think for everyone, uh, you're listening in, um, you know, yeah, it will be a bumpy 12 to 18 months. Uh, but, you know, I think the value and the future of this part of the sector has never been in my opinion, more solidified. And, uh, you know, we got to keep that optimism. Well, I would tell you, and, and thank you so much for being such a dynamic thought leader out there, right? You're never afraid to share your position or challenge other people's. Um, and, and that's such a big part of it. I mean, we, we have someone that just commented, Ryan's passion's next level and very inspiring. And so I'll tell you, when I first made the transition out of out of Regis, you were one of the first uh, videos that I saw talking about the future of Flex. And I used it for months. I, I probably a year. <laughs> I'd be like, look, this guy gets it. Uh, well, because, I appreciate that. Yeah, even though Mark Dixon started IWG 30 years ago, he just didn't have that 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 passion, right? It's It's a different level of leadership. And so certainly... Thank you for that. Thank you for being a gracious leader and host um, and taking time to be with us. No, I mean, it's, uh, this is, I love this stuff and I've been, you know, I, I saw, I saw what Jamie did and I was like, oh, I, I got to get on there. So, you know, um, I really appreciate the opportunity to come and, you know, spend time with both of you. Uh, appreciate that we got to talk about personal stuff too. Um, you know, I think, uh, at the end of the day, we're all human. And, um, uh, and so I appreciate you making sure that we, we weave uh, you know, some of that in. And a you know, special thank you to everyone that uh, joined live. And if you're going to watch the recording, uh, you know, thanks for, for, tuning, for tuning in. Okay, now we have to let Ryan go find his iPhone. <laughs> no, so by the way, I was like, I'm so relieved. I hear it buzzing in the okay. room. <laughs> I, I have no idea where it is. And I'm in literally like a conference room. I, I, it's crazy to me that I can't find it, but I keep hearing it buzzing. So like, I think I'm good. 
That's awesome. <laughs> well, I appreciate it. Have, a, have right. a great rest of your day. Awesome. Well, thank you both so much. Uh, and hopefully we'll get a chance to see each other live soon. Yep. Perfect. Thanks. All right. Awesome. Thanks. Bye.